dark alleys and flashing police lights, the sound of a distant siren wailing through the night, the soft click of a lock being picked, and a heart pounding so loud it could be mistaken for the footsteps of someone on the run. It's Wednesday, my friends, and not just any Wednesday. This is Wanted Wednesdays, the day you tune in to The Real Crime Diary, Daily Dose of Crime, where tales of the cunning and elusive take center stage. I'm your host, MHB, reaching out through the darkness directly to your speakers to guide you through the twisted labyrinth of the world's most notorious fugitives. Are you ready to meet the ghostly figures that haunt the fringes of our society? The masterminds, the escape artists, the ones who slip through the fingers of justice time and time again. Each week, we shine a spotlight on these phantoms in flight, delve into their infamous deeds, and unravel the global chase that unfolds in their wake. Together, we'll step into the shoes of the pursuers and the pursued, feeling the thrill of the chase, the frustration of near misses, and the relentless drive for closure. So lock your doors, dim the lights, and hold on tight. You're about to embark on a journey into the underbelly of the criminal world where every clue could be the key and every moment could lead to capture. This is Wanted Wednesdays on The Real Crime Diary, Daily Dose of Crime. Let the manhunt begin. Picture it. The late 1940s, America is settling into the peace and prosperity that followed the Second World War. But beneath the veneer of tranquil suburban life and booming business, a menace lurks. The nation's criminals, unperturbed by the domestic bliss of the average American, continue their nefarious deeds. It was an age where tough guys with Tommy guns and fedoras weren't just figments of noir cinema. They were flesh and blood, and they were making the headlines. Now, let's step into the corridors of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, where the air is thick with cigarette smoke and the clack of typewriters. J. Edgar Hoover, the formidable director of the FBI, sits in his office, an office that had seen more secrets than most spy novels. Enter William Kinsey Hutchinson, editor-in-chief of the International News Service, ripe with an idea that could potentially change the game in law enforcement. It's late 1949, and the two men hatch a plan, not over grandiose strategy sessions or in hidden bunkers, but over a simple civil conversation. They ask themselves, how do we bring the focus of the masses onto these hoodlums, these toughest guys that keep slipping through the fingers of the law? What follows is an idea that solidifies into a staple of crime prevention, a list. But not just any list, a list that would detail the names and faces of the most sinister, the most cunning, and by default, the most wanted fugitives that the FBI was on the hunt for. With the stroke of a pen, Hutchinson pens an article listing these public enemies. The response? a resounding clamor for more. The public couldn't get enough of this rogues gallery, and what started as an article exploded into what we know today as the FBI 10 most wanted fugitives list. Like wildfire, the idea catches on, and on March 14, 1950, Hoover and the FBI make it official. It's almost cinematic how the very first list came into being, heralding a new era in the fight against crime. And at the top, the dubious honor goes to Thomas J. Holden, known for his bank-robbing escapades with the Holden Keating Gang, a man whose fame leaped from the most wanted poster to the annals of criminal history on day one. From then on, being on the most wanted wasn't just about infamy. It was a signal to law enforcement officials nationwide that you, my friend, are a priority. The criteria were strict, reserved only for those who posed a significant threat to society, the ones whose crimes were so severe, so shocking, that they compelled a nationwide manhunt. Capturing these fugitives becomes a matter of public service, a collective effort ringing the clarion call that society would not stand for such lawlessness. And let me tell you, the criteria weren't enough to guarantee a spot on this list. You also needed to have a penchant for elusiveness, a knack for giving the authorities the slip. For decades, the list continued to evolve, becoming a crucial tool in the FBI's crime-fighting arsenal. It morphed into a way to engage the public, to transform every citizen into a watchful eye, a potential informant. The message was clear. If you see something, say something. It was, and still is, an all-hands-on-deck approach to justice. As we scrutinize this tapestry of crime and punishment, the striking feature is not just the nefarious acts that placed these individuals on the list, 
It's also the persistence and ingenuity of the law enforcement agencies that pursued them. It's the acknowledgement that in the pursuit of justice, innovation is just as vital as the adherence to the law. So you see, the FBI's most wanted list is more than a catalog of criminal faces. It's a symbol of the ceaseless endeavor to maintain order, a promise that no stone would be left unturned in the pursuit of the nation's most dangerous. It's a pivotal element in the narrative of law enforcement, and its creation story is one that's been imprinted on the very identity of crime fighting in the United States and beyond. J. Edgar Hoover might not have anticipated it back in 1949, but that single list transcended its initial purpose, becoming a fixture of popular culture and a beacon for justice. It reminds us that no matter how notorious the fugitive, there's always a name, always a face, and behind them always a story. The legacy of that list, a product of a simple conversation between two men in a bygone era, continues to resonate daring the cunning shadows to step into the light. Imagine you're a seasoned investigator at the FBI, meticulously sifting through dossiers of the nation's most dangerous fugitives. Your task? To determine who makes it onto that notorious roster, the FBI's 10 most wanted. It's not just about cherry-picking the worst of the worst. There's a rigorous process, a set of criteria as strict as it is secretive, shaping the grim gallery we know as the 10 most wanted fugitives list, you see, before a criminal's face graces the FBI's most infamous list, their file lands on the desks at the Criminal Investigative Division at FBI headquarters. Here, agents pore over cases submitted by all 56 field offices. They're not just looking for any fugitive. They seek individuals whose crimes have cut deep into the fabric of society, whose capture demands the concerted effort of law enforcement nationwide. Each nominee's dossier is scrutinized, their alleged crimes weighed for their gravity, and the threat they pose to the public's safety. But it's not as simple as labeling someone bad enough. The proposed candidates are reviewed not only by agents, but also by the Office of Public Affairs. Why the PR folks, you ask? Because the list isn't just a tool for law enforcement, it's a beacon for public assistance, designed as much to alert civilians as it is to mobilize cops. The short list of fugitives is then forwarded, advancing through the ranks until it reaches the desk of the assistant director of the CID. Consider this the semifinals, where stakes are high and each criminal's record is on trial. Ultimately, it's the FBI director who stamps their approval, sealing the fate of another face to be feared and found. Now, covertly sidling onto the list is one thing, but making an exit is another matter entirely. Most fugitives are crossed off only when they're captured, meet their demise, or if the charges that landed them there in the first place are dropped. But there's an elusive 11th case. Occasionally, a fugitive is removed after a reassessment deems them no longer a particularly dangerous menace. It's a rare reprieve, signaling a marked change in how their threat level is perceived. Take Victor Manuel Garina, for instance. Once a machete-wielding member of the Machetero, he clung to the list for an astonishing 32 years. Then there's the curious case of Billy Austin Bryant, whose fleeting fame lasted a mere two hours on the list before his apprehension. These are not mere anecdotes. They're subplots in the ongoing saga of the FBI's dogged pursuit. To date, the list has evolved, even welcoming a number 11 in exceptional instances, when a fugitive is deemed extremely dangerous. But the Bureau cannot justify bumping any current tenants of the 10. That public list you glance at in the post office or that shares screen space on your social feed is more than a wanted poster. It's the product of a meticulous, methodical process, each entry a chapter in a larger story of crime and consequence. It speaks to the resilience of law enforcement, the tenacity in the face of cunning, and to the shadows that these fugitives cast, a darkness only the bright beacon of justice can dispel. Picture this, a vast network of borders, countries with different laws and law enforcement agencies operating under diverse protocols. The very definition of a fugitive is one who runs, who vanishes into the ether, and the international landscape is riddled with invisible lines that, once crossed, can often mean the difference between capture and continued evasion. Welcome to The Invisible Lines, a segment where we delve into the complexities of international law enforcement cooperation 
and the psychological cat and mouse game between the pursued and the pursuers. So let's talk about these international challenges first. One of the major hurdles that law enforcement deals with is the variance in extradition treaties. These treaties are crucial. They're the agreements that allow one country to surrender a fugitive to another. But here's the catch. Not all countries have treaties with each other, and when they do, the conditions can be incredibly specific. This creates safe havens for fugitives, pockets of the world where they can theoretically hide out indefinitely. But it goes beyond treaties. There's the matter of differing legal systems. Some countries require a mountain of evidence before they're willing to detain and extradite someone accused of a crime in another country. And let's not get started on the political relations. Sometimes fugitives are unwittingly caught in the crosshairs of international diplomacy, or worse, used as pawns in a larger game. Now think about the people making these daring escapes. They're not just running, they're adapting, adopting new cultures and languages, often forging documents or assuming new identities. Dr. Elizabeth Yardley, a criminologist, explains it succinctly. Evading capture isn't just about knowing where to hide, it's about knowing how to blend in. The most successful fugitives are chameleons, not just in their appearance, but in their behavior. What's fascinating here is the duality of their situation. On one hand, there's the constant fear of getting caught. On the other, there's the thrill of outsmarting law enforcement. The adrenaline rush can be addictive. It's this psychological struggle that we often overlook. Living like a ghost, one eye always looking over your shoulder, is a torturous existence. Paranoia becomes a constant companion. Some experts suggest that this lifestyle can have deleterious effects on a fugitive's mental health, leading to a sense of isolation, depression, and sometimes a self-destructive desire to be caught to end the charade. John A. Eterno, retired NYPD detective and professor of criminal justice, shares a profound observation. In some ways, the pursuit can become personal. Law enforcement officers may develop a kind of rapport with their elusive target, studying their patterns, their habits, getting into their mind. It's an intimate game of wits where you might respect the fugitive's cunning but never forget the need for justice that propels the chase. Complexities also arise in tracking financial trails across countries. Money laundering laws vary and pursuing a fugitive's assets across borders can be like navigating through a labyrinth with every banking law being a different turn. The advent of technology has added new layers. Cybersecurity expert Amanda Rousseau points out the digital realm is its own jurisdiction. Tracking fugitives who have the know-how to cover their digital footprints is akin to chasing a ghost through the wires. Now let's make it a bit more interactive. What do you think? Does the adrenaline and the psychological rush associated with the run outweigh the fear and the paranoia? Or is it the other way around? The ethical and legal debates here are endless. Are we equipped internationally to support each other in the seamless capture of those who run from their crimes? Or are we disadvantaged by our differences? We also have to consider the human aspect of law enforcement. These are people dedicating their lives to hunting shadows, often at significant personal cost. The toll it takes on them is something former FBI agent Frank Montoya Jr. described poignantly. It's not just a job, it's a calling, a dedication to a global sense of justice. But remember, these fugitives, they aren't just running from us. They're running from societal norms, and every additional day they're out there is a day we've to work twice as hard to prove that no one is above the law. The international chessboard of fugitive capture is intricate, where each pawn move is dictated by laws, treaties, political plays, and human wit. It's a real test of global cooperation against the backdrop of individual cunning. This wraps up the invisible lines. As we traverse the globe in pursuit of justice, remember this dance between the hunter and the hunted. The law might seem a step behind, but it's a persistent force, stopping at nothing to bring those who run to heel. And as always, your thoughts, insights, and theories on this complex subject are what enrich our discussion. Don't hesitate to let us know what you think. Let's take a moment to reflect on the incredible impact of public engagement when it comes to the pursuit of justice. For decades, the FBI's most wanted list has been more than a catalog of criminality. It's been an invitation for collective action, a crowdsourced manhunt, if you will. 
It's the people's participation that has transformed these searches from mere investigations to full-fledged captures, sometimes leading to fugitives taking an unexpected step, turning themselves in. The strategic display of the FBI's most wanted list in places like post offices might seem quaint in our digital world, but this simple method has a storied history of success. Before social media, before the internet, it was these public spaces that spoke directly to the conscience of a community, and on some occasions, the conscience of those on the run. It is the haunting gaze of fugitives' portraits that stares back at passersby, silently charging them with the task of surveillance, to not just see, but to watch, to pay attention. Yes, the posters call out crimes, undeniable they are, but within the ink, they also whisper a plea, help us find them. And historically, the public has answered by serving as the eyes and ears of law enforcement, proving that the many will always see more than the few. There have been instances where this visibility has resulted in fugitives turning themselves in, weary perhaps from looking over their shoulder or maybe seeking a sliver of redemption. Take Leslie Isbin Rogue, for example, who in 1996 surrendered at the U.S. Embassy in Guatemala City. What makes Leslie's story noteworthy? Well, folks, he was the first ever fugitive on the FBI's most wanted list to be apprehended thanks to the FBI's burgeoning presence on the Internet. Think about that. A web page led to the capture of a man on the lam. That marked a pivotal moment in intersection between traditional manhunt techniques and burgeoning cyber sleuthing. One can't overstate the seismic shift the Internet has brought to crime fighting efforts with every click, every share. Fugitives can go viral, their faces and stories spreading exponentially faster than they can run. We're living in a time where digital fingerprints can be as damning as the physical ones left behind on a doorknob or letter. Everyone with an internet connection could potentially help close a case. Leslie's act of self-surrender came at a moment when the FBI had just begun to explore the World Wide Web's potential in aiding their manhunts. And now, in 2023, we've got a global network at our disposal. It's the hyperconnectivity that collapses the space between us and the shadowy figures we're chasing. Through websites, social media, and digital databases, criminals find it increasingly difficult to shrink away into anonymity. But what does this all mean for our society? Are we all deputies in this digital age, avatars of justice? And how does this shared responsibility shape our interaction with the world around us? While the internet might be the sparkling new tool in our collective belt, it's the time-tested power of community, the human connection, that continues to be the backbone of any successful manhunt. As we ponder these questions, let's not forget the stories of those who've heeded the call. Their vigilance and sometimes their conscience have been crucial in this ongoing game of hide-and-seek. And as we continue to digitize our world, let's remember that underneath the ones and zeros, it's our collective action, our eyes on the ground and in the cloud that makes the difference. So to all you digital detectives out there, keep your eyes peeled, keep sharing, and who knows, you may just be the key to solving the next big case. In the dark corners of the underworld, the specter of elusive criminals haunt the corridors of justice, their names inscribed in infamy on the FBI's most wanted list. Today, in our deep dive into the profiles of evasion, we will unfurl the tales of some of the most cunning and slippery outlaws of our time. Alexis Flores' story runs cold, as chilling as his crimes. He lurked amidst the streets of Philadelphia, and in July 2000, a precious, innocent life, five-year-old Iriana de Jesus was tragically seized, her future stolen. Flores, once behind bars for forgery, walked free, unsuspecting until matching DNA rewrote his destiny as one of the most wanted. It's a stark reminder of the cruel juxtaposition between the perceived ordinary and the hidden monstrous within. On a quiet day in April, a donut shop in Hanover, Maryland became the stage for a grim tale starring Badresh Kumar Chetanbhai Patel. His calm demeanor was a deceptive mask that concealed a lethal rage. With one heinous act stabbing and killing his wife, Patel transformed from a seemingly benign figure to a fugitive, his trace vanishing like mist. This story is a harrowing testament to how deep domestic enigmas can run, prompting us to question the facades presented by those among us. Our narrative takes a darker turn with the grim saga of Alejandro Castillo.
The plot twisted with the betrayal of affection, erupting in the murder of Truquan Sandy Lee Lay, a young woman entangled with Castillo through shared workplace ties and a history of romance. Despair clings to this story, reminding us how quickly love can sour into violence. Then there's Arnoldo Jimenez, marked by a wedding stained with blood. Hours after pledging lifelong commitment, he turned his vows into a horrifying epilogue, allegedly killing his bride. As she lay in her bathtub, Jimenez slipped through the grasp of the law, leaving agony in his wake. Enter the world of Yulan Adonai Arcaga Carrias, where shadows cast over Honduras are shaped by his commands. As the alleged leader of MS-13, Archaga Carrias' name evokes terror, his deeds carried out with impunity, his empire built on narcotics, firearms, and the ruination of rivals. His reign of fear transcends borders, leaving a trail of violence reaching even into the United States. In the realm of financial deception, Ruja Ignatova, dubbed the Crypto Queen, fashioned a castle built on the sand of a massive fraud scheme known as OneCoin. Like a modern-day phantom, Ignatova vanished in a wisp, her connections to Bulgaria and Germany now a puzzling web for authorities to unravel. On the streets of Los Angeles, Omar Alexander Cardenas's tale unfolds amidst a violent summer, leaving behind a tale of death that clings to the walls of a local barbershop. As one life is brutally cut short, Cardenas eludes capture, a ghostly figure in a sprawling cityscape. And the story of Wilver Villegas Palomino echoes through the mountains of Colombia, where the clash of ideologies breeds narco-terrorism. As a member of the ELN, his ongoing crusade against the state left a bloodstain that marks him as a dangerous blight, drawing a hefty bounty on his apprehension. Donald Eugene Fields the Sand skulks in the darkest recesses of the criminal world, wanted for the sexual exploitation of innocence. His actions, hidden under the guise of normalcy, leave a legacy of exploitation and unanswered questions about his whereabouts. Finally, we reach the doorstep of Vitalom Innocent, a Haitian enforcer whose very name belies his actions. His leadership within the Crase Barrier gang carries the heavy burden of kidnappings and a murder that cross sex with American lives, painting a portrait of international dread. These individuals, each with stories more haunting than the last, remind us that some masks worn in society conceal faces that justice yearns to unveil. Their evasion is a complex dance, sometimes a dash in the shadows, other times a slow, methodical game of disguise and identity. Their lives weave narratives that cross borders, challenge authority, and leave us grasping for answers in a world where the line between seen and unseen is as thin as air. Our look into these profiles of evasion exposes the complex canvas of criminality, escape, and the relentless pursuit of justice. As we immerse ourselves in these stories, we can't help but wonder, what turns a person down this path? How does a fugitive stay a ghost in the age of surveillance? The tales that unfold on the FBI's most wanted list are not just manhunts. They're quests to understand the human psyche, to restore peace where there's chaos, and above all, to assert the tenacity of the law over those who believe they are beyond its reach. Rewards and Incentives Now let's shift gears and talk about something that might just pique your interest. Money. Ah, but not just any money. We're talking about the sizable bounties placed on the heads of those who've managed to skirt the law, the kind of cash that might make even the most honest citizen glance over their shoulder twice. You see, there's a whole mechanism in place, a rewards system, designed to incentivize the public to get involved in the manhunt. Since its inception, there has been a minimum standard reward for information that leads directly to the apprehension of these wanted fugitives. A cool $100,000. That's enough to make anyone's eyes widen. But hold on to your hats, because as of May 2023, that amount got an astonishing bump to $250,000. Why the increase, you might wonder? Well, it's a reflection of the times, an acknowledgement by the FBI that the more egregious the crime, the deeper they must dig into the Treasury to entice information that could lead to a capture. And in some exceptional cases, the bounty can skyrocket even further. Take Yulan Adenay Archaga Karias, for example. The alleged leader of MS-13 for all of Honduras comes with a staggering $5 million price tag for valuable intel. Now that's what we call high stakes. But let's talk effectiveness. 
Does flashing a quarter of a million dollars actually work? Think about it. You'd essentially become a part of the justice system, a civilian deputy. It's almost like a real life game of where in the world is Carmen San Diego, except the stakes are very, very real. Indeed, there have been cases where that kind of promise has parted the curtains of silence within a community where loyalty bends under the weight of a life-changing sum of money. When greed, or let's call it civic duty, triumphs over fear or complicity, the most proficient vanishing acts reach their final act. That's the power of rewards and incentives, my friends. They bridge the gap between the shadows where fugitives lurk and the spotlight of justice. And while it may appear a mercenary approach to some, you cannot deny the tangible results, captures and convictions that may not have been possible otherwise. And when the FBI increases the ante, it's not just about capturing a fugitive. It's a clear message to all who dare evade the law. No matter how cunning you think you are, there's always a number that will make you wanted by someone. So what do you think, listeners? If you had that golden piece of information, would you come forward? Does the idea of a cash reward sway you to keep your eyes peeled? Let's not forget, it's not just about the money. It's about safety, about justice, and about closure for families who've been wronged. It's one piece in the complex puzzle of law enforcement, an alluring piece, perhaps, but a crucial one, all the same. When we speak of the game of cat and mouse between law enforcement and fugitives, we must marvel at the sheer creativity and cunning it takes to orchestrate a successful manhunt. It's not just about boots on the ground. It's a cerebral challenge that often requires an almost theatrical sense of imagination. Case in point, let's discuss one of the most innovative and ingenious manhunts in history, Operation Flagship. Back in December 1985, the U.S. Marshals, in cahoots with the Metropolitan Police Department in Washington, D.C., pulled off what could easily be a plot from a Hollywood blockbuster. They set the stage at the Washington Convention Center and sent out invitations that would tug right at the heartstrings of any sports fan, a chance to watch the much-coveted Washington Redskins take on the Cincinnati Bengals. But there was a twist. This event was exclusively for the winners of two free tickets, not just any winners, but wanted fugitives. Now, you may wonder how on earth did they manage to convince these runaways to waltz into their own capture? Well, the marshals knew their audience. Redskins tickets were like gold dust, and the thrill of not only scoring a ticket, but also a chance to net tickets to Super Bowl XX was too tempting to pass up. Using the fictitious flagship international sports television as the front, they played the ultimate psychological bait and switch. But preparations were intricate and meticulous. Like a magician carefully setting up their grand illusion, Chief Deputy U.S. Marshal Tobias P. Roach and U.S. Marshal Herbert M. Rutherford III strategized every detail. They considered everything from the obsessively loyal Redskins fan base to the careful wording of the invitations. Even the RSVP system was part of the ruse, inviting the criminal elite to confirm their attendance with operators who, delightfully, would put them on hold to I Fought the Law as background music. The day of the operation, the convention center transformed into a theater of law enforcement with officers cast in the roles of tuxedoed ushers, cheerleaders, and even sports mascots, all armed and stealthily awaiting the reveal of the curtain. And like any good performance, timing was everything. As the guests arrived, they were greeted with the hospitality befitting a VIP sports fan, ID checks, color-coded name tags, and a buffet brunch served as prelude to the moment of truth. Using code words and maneuvers rehearsed to precision, once the signal word surprise was dropped, the place erupted not in cheers for a touchdown, but with the swift advance of the special operations group storming the auditorium. Tactical gear hidden beneath the guise of game day revelry revealed as they closed in on the unsuspecting fugitives. The operation was a spectacle of strategic deception and bold execution resulting in 101 arrests, a testament to the power of leveraging human psychology and pop culture in the pursuit of justice. Even the names involved held a touch of playfulness and wit. I, Michael Detnaw, indeed. But there's a weight to this tale beyond the cleverness and the snappy subterfuge. 
It's about the painstaking lengths to which agencies like the U.S. Marshals will go to protect our streets. Fugitives who may have been violent or posed significant risks to the community were swept up efficiently and without incident, a soaring victory for public safety. Yet, looking back, some may entertain the ethical debate around using deceit in the quest to enforce the law. It raises the question, do the ends justify the means? However one falls on that debate, it cannot be denied that the legacy of Operation Flagship lives on in the annals of crime-fighting lore, a paragon of innovative manhunts that not only snares fugitives but also captivates through its sheer audacity and flair. So, the next time you receive a too-good-to-be-true invitation, perhaps it'll give you pause. For the wanted out there, could it be the long arm of the law extending an invite through the veiled masquerade of fortune? Because in the world of law enforcement, creative strategy often trumps brute force, and the vigilant eyes of justice never cease to watch, to plan, and to act in the most unpredictable ways. Now we turn our focus to the ethical dilemmas that emerge from these captivating manhunts. It's not just the thrill of the chase. There are profound moral questions at play. Imagine being tasked with tracking down a dangerous fugitive. Where do you draw the line between justice and privacy, between law enforcement's reach and individual rights? How far should one go to ensure the ends justify the means? One particularly thorny issue is the tactic of entrapment. Remember Operation Flagship, where law enforcement tricked fugitives into thinking they'd won free football tickets? Well, it worked, netting over 100 arrests. But it does beg the question, is it ethical to deceive individuals, even if they're wanted criminals, into incriminating themselves? And then there's the role of the public. When is it appropriate to involve civilians in matters of law enforcement through rewards for information? Could this potentially put innocent lives at risk? What about the snitch stigma in certain communities? How do these rewards affect the social fabric in these areas? We also need to consider the impact of excessive media coverage. It can be a valuable tool in aiding law enforcement, but can it also compromise a fair trial leading to a trial by media scenario? Imagine you're on the jury for one of these high-profile cases. Could you truly erase all preconceived notions drawn from those most wanted posters you've seen in the post office or from the evening news? The interplay between raising awareness and prejudicing a potential jury pool is a delicate balance indeed. And let's not forget about the psychological toll on the families of the accused. They're often thrown under the spotlight whether guilty by association or through sheer kinship. What ethical obligations do we owe to these family members? Collateral damage by a kin's actions. You see, with every episode of Wanted Wednesdays, we're dipping our toes into a sea of moral quandaries. The weave of ethics within crime and justice is intricate. So let me ask you, where do you stand on these issues? Do you see black and white, or are you muddling through the gray like most of us? This is a call to you, our community of armchair detectives and crime enthusiasts, to weigh in on these questions. Take to the comments, your social media soapboxes, and let's discuss the tough questions. How do you reconcile the need for capturing those who have evaded justice while respecting ethical boundaries? Your insights matter, and who knows? They might just shine a light on the shades of gray in the seemingly black and white world of crime and punishment. When a name is etched onto the FBI's 10 most wanted fugitives list, it's not just a marker of one individual's misdeeds. It's a ripple effect that washes over entire communities. The presence of a wanted criminal in the midst could mean a cloud of fear hanging over a town, a city, an entire region. Today, we peer into that shadow, examining the profound impact these fugitives have on the communities they've touched. Consider first the climate of tension the uneasy whispers between neighbors, the double takes at strangers that become a part of daily life. It's an immeasurable cost, this theft of tranquility and trust from a community's core. And what about local businesses, constantly on alert? Or the slew of closed signs that pepper the streets when fear is palpable in the air? Then there are the victims and their loved ones, a narrative that's all too often overshadowed by the pursuit of the criminal. 
They're left grappling with a unique unrest that comes from knowing their assailant still walks free, their nightmares untethered, drifting in the wind of uncertainty and injustice. Their advocates tell us time doesn't necessarily heal. Closure is just a word that offers scant comfort when the person responsible for their agony roams without retribution. Yet the stories of resilience are just as powerful. Heroes emerge from the ashes of these trials, community leaders, activists, everyday people who bind together, forging bonds stronger than they perhaps ever anticipated. Vigils are held not just as a plea for justice, but as a testament to the human spirit's will to triumph over darkness. One must also ponder the moral quandary. When a fugitive is eventually caught, what then? Some breathe a sigh of relief, a proverbial lifting of the siege. For others, it's the start of a long, arduous process. Trials, hearings, the relentless churn of the justice system, each step a reminder of the hurt that has burrowed deep into the heart of the community. We've seen it before, how the capture of a person on that notorious list can be a balm, yet the scars inevitably remain. Kids who used to play ball in the streets grow cautious, eyeing passerby with suspicion. Families look over their shoulders. And whilst there is undoubtedly relief, there's also the reflection the untold stories of how this experience has forever changed them. These narratives underscore the understated bravery of those who suffer the most, the courage to keep pushing for justice, the determination to rebuild lives from the ruins left in a criminal's wake. Theirs is a story that doesn't always make the headlines, but it is rich with the themes that define humanity, endurance, resilience, and the shared pursuit of a day when the shadows give way to the light. Now, as we think about the names gracing that list, let's remember that they are not just fugitives from the law, they are fugitives from conscience. And their actions echo in the lives of countless individuals who have done nothing to deserve their plight. The fabric of a community torn, yes, but not shattered, holds testament to the collective will of a people united against the fear, turmoil, and injustice brought on by those who have eluded capture. It's this reflection, this acknowledgement of the community impact that I invite us to carry with us as we delve deeper into the stories of the undesired yet unforgotten members of that infamous list, acknowledging not just the crime, but the human costs, the resilience and the unwavering hope for resolution. And just like the final pages of a gripping thriller, we draw to a close on today's dive into the murky depths of the criminal world. But unlike a book, the stories we've encountered today are far from fiction. They underscore a stark reality that for justice to be served, the chase must go on. From the tenacious efforts of law enforcement to the pivotal role of public assistance, every aspect we've explored today plays a crucial part in the pursuit of those who are, as of now, beyond the grasp of the law. Reflecting on the history of the FBI's 10 most wanted fugitives list, we can't help but admire the longevity and evolution of this vital tool for justice. It's a reminder of the unfailing commitment to track down and apprehend those who think they've outsmarted the system. For every cunning evasion, there's an equally innovative strategy being deployed to bring these fugitives to justice. We've recounted harrowing tales of evasion, painted portraits of those who've left a trail of terror in their wake and celebrated the sheer ingenuity and determination that goes into capturing these figures. And in the process, we've discovered that each of us can be more than just bystanders in these narratives of crime and punishment. Now it's over to you, our intrepid listeners, your engagement, your tips, your discussions. They all could make the difference in these intricate puzzles of manhunts. By keeping the conversation going, by sharing this episode, or by taking a moment to reflect on what you've learned, you're contributing to a greater cause. And so I implore you, subscribe, share, discuss. Let's not only partake in storytelling, but be a part of the living story that unfolds every day in the real world. Be vigilant, stay curious, and who knows, perhaps your sharp eye or voice suspicion could be what turns a wanted Wednesday into a captured Thursday. In the end, the true measure of our society's dedication to justice isn't just recorded in ledgers of captured fugitives. It's etched in the collective memory of our communities who bear the weight of these crimes. 
Together, let's keep these cases in the limelight, support those who serve and protect, and ensure that one day each of these chapters will have a fitting end. Until next time, I'm MHB, your guide through The Real Crime Diary, Daily Dose of Crime, Wanted Wednesdays. Stay safe out there, and remember, justice may be delayed, but it should never be denied.